Hello everyone, nice to see so many faces here. We are today talking about Zero Trust. Yeah, also welcome from my side, we are <laughs> doing the talk as two. Um, so we want, as you obviously see, want to talk about Zero Trust. So we want to explain why we think it is uh, really important. We want to explain why we think it's hard because there are so many different aspects and options to consider. Um, and why of course we think it's worth putting constant effort uh, into that topic. Before we start, let's do a short introduction that you know who's talking to you. So my name is Daniel Pötzinger. I'm CTO of AOE. Uh, AOE is a software development service company. Um, yeah, and one of my passions or interest is everything around the complexity of software architecture and the related team organizations. And this is also what I want to bring as a perspective to that talk. Yeah. yeah. And my name is Kevin. Uh, I'm responsible for DevOps and Cloud Consulting at AOE. And in my daily work, I support customers migrating from on-premise into the cloud. And my uh, key competences lay in uh, infrastructure as code in uh, public clouds like AWS and, of course, in Zero Trust architectures. And before we dive deep into Zero Trust, I want to ask you guys, do you still remember the Equifax hack back in, I think, 2017? Anyone? Oh, a couple of hands, yeah. Um, so uh, don't worry, I'll tell you something about it. So um, Equifax is uh, a multinational consumer credit reporting agency holding around 800 million customer data. And in 2017, attackers used a widely known vulnerability to gain access to their internal systems and they were able to uh, leak 150 million of their customer data. And um, in the end, Equifax had to pay 700 million in compensation fees. And that's a huge business crit uh, risk. Um, when we look deeper into um, what happened technically, it was absolutely avoidable. Because they had a vulnerability in Apache Struts, which is an MVC framework for Java. And uh, this vulnerability was widely known. But the attackers used it because they didn't fix that vulnerability to gain access to internal servers. And because they didn't have a proper network segmentation, the attackers were able to um, find unencrypted personal passwords on network shares. And if that's not enough, the data they have queried with that personal credentials was not encrypted. And yeah, in the end, unfortunately, they had a broken intrusion detection because certificates were expired and the intrusion detection was not working. You know, they, they haven't detected that breach for a couple of months. So the attackers were able to push that data out of the internal network. Good, and um, that is obviously not the only like hacking news that uh, got to the press. The press is full of news of brands getting hacked and data that got breached. Um, so you probably have um, seen them as well. Um, and there's a very yeah, dangerous and sad fact. Um, we have uh, we, we've brought with you uh, for you some statistic. In this case, the statistics on how many attacks uh, are happening on the software supply chain. Um, and as you see in the statistic here, uh, it shows an exponential grow. And this is not the only statistic that is showing in that direction. There are statistics around um, showing the amount of money that has been paid for ransomware attacks um, or in general the amount of data that has been uh, leaked. Um, and I think that reasons for this are different, of course, obviously. Everything is digitalized, everything is, yeah, distributed, you have mobile devices, you have IoT, so there's just more to hack because there's more data and digitalization in place. But um, another fact is, and I think that's important to be aware of, that this is a business model in itself. So there are a lot of organizations and groups that are earning money with professionally uh, searching for vulnerabilities and uh, really dealing with ransomware and data. Um, so what this intro kind of should show, it is definitely an important topic. It it will probably even be more and more important in the future. So we have to talk about security. Um, and when we talk about security from a very abstract point of view, security has a lot to do with trust. It's actually based on trust. It's about um, who do you trust 
to let into something in your system, in your application, how to trust if someone is the one who claims to be he is. So security is based on trust. And when we look back, um, and this is also where the zero trust framework kind of originated from, when we uh, look back in the more classical security thinking and secu security models, trust used to be based on network parameters. So once you're in a company network, once you're in a company location, you're considered to be in and you're trusted to do more or less everything that you can do because you're in. If you work from outside, typical access was VPN. Again, if you got that barrier, you're considered to be in. And that's obviously a high risk because there's a lot of risk of potential, potential data breaches. Also, the security model really has fallen out of time because users are moving out, data is moving out, apps are moving out, remote work is very popular. So everything is moving out of the perimeter. Um, and this is why we definitely need a complete new way of thinking about security. Yeah. And this is where zero trust kicks in. So zero trust has one key sentence and this is never trust, always verify. The idea is that you always assume a breach in your network infrastructure for each request. So you do a least privileged concept, not on access rights only, you do that least privileged concept on your whole infrastructure, beginning from the network until your application. And a strong identity is really the essence of a zero trust architecture. And um, if you build a zero trust architecture, um, you definitely reduce the risk um, and uh, you also support your employees uh, to work from anywhere because you now have access from everywhere to your infrastructure as you would have it when you're sitting in your corporate network. You have the same security barriers for both. And zero trust has a lot of aspects. Uh, it's a very complex and multi-dimensional topic and that's also the reason why we are doing the talk, to talk together. You, just, you cannot just um, uh, look at one aspect, you have to look at all the different aspects in Zero Trust. And we will go through all of the aspects today, but since it's so complex, we can just deep dive into two of them. And that will be the identity and identity awareness, and uh, we will deep dive into application security. And there are also a couple of meta aspects that needs to be considered. It's about your organization, it's about your delivery pipeline, and it's also about automation and monitoring. Good, so the, the subclaim of the talk is the hard way. So um, before we start, I want to prove that it is hard. Um, I think from the slide before, you can already imagine that there is yeah, it's not easy because there are so many aspects and tools and options. Um, and this is also what the statistic says. This is a statistic from our friends from uh, Splunk. Um, they did a research or survey for in organizations um, in security teams. Um, and I think that even this limits the amount of organizations. Not every organization has a dedicated security team. And uh, over half of them really report it's hard to keep up with all the security requirements. Um, nearly everyone, 88%, reports that we need more know-how. We have a constant challenge of finding the right talents to work on security topics. Um, and more than half of them like, are really frustrated with changing from one tool to the other. So I think this is proof already that it's obviously hard. Um, and the last point brings me to the tool aspect of that, um, because th that is another aspect that, make it, that, that makes it so hard and complex, because there are so many tools, best practices, aspects um, that you need to consider where you want to choose a, a good decision for your context. Um, so there's definitely not one if app fits all. On the other hand, um, of course, it's good to have such a vital ecosystem that is constantly growing, because especially in the security environment, you shouldn't build something yourself. Uh, you should rely on something that is out there. And that it's worth really putting effort into this and doing it right. That's, I think, one of the last statistics of the slide. Um, security leaders are the one considered that are really doing good, at least in, in most of the aspects we mentioned. Um, statistics show that they are much more efficient in blocking attacks, detecting data leaks, and actually also resolving um, uh, the issues and uh, resolving breaches and closing breaches. Now we can go to the more content. We part. love statistics, <laughs> as you can see. 
<laughs> so the most important thing is the identity because we just learned that it's about verification. Every request needs to be verified. So you need something to verify. And this is the identity. And when we talk from an identity, um, we mean a unique entity that could be a person, a device, or even an application that can be authenticated or author and authorized to access something. And there's a huge difference between authentication and authorization, which still a lot of people are doing wrong. Authentication means the proof of an identity. Are you the entity that you claim to be? And authorization is about what are you allowed to do? So that's the difference that I want to note here. By the way, I really like the image because like, it's really <laughs> shaking the authentication. Are you the one you... And then it's he's deciding if you are authorized to pass the yeah. um, password controls. I like that image. <laughs> Yeah, and SSO is absolutely key because on average an employee has to switch between 10 applications per hour and if you don't have a concept around it, uh, it doesn't make really sense to implement a zero trust architecture. But SSO is only the concept. It generates you the seamless user experience. You need a tool for it. And those tools are called IAM solutions. Uh, the key component in an IAM solution is an IDP, an identity provider, um, which gives you a centralized source of your identities, roles, and groups, and give you a centralized view of it. And this also enables you a centralized auditability. You are now able to audit your identities. And this is absolutely key. And a very important uh, aspect from an uh, IAM solution is also that you are allowed to block a compromised uh, identity in one central place. If you have a compromised identity, you can block it and the end identity is not able to communicate with your infrastructure anymore. And there are a lot of implementations out there. I mean, if you are already using one of the big three, you're probably good to go with uh, their implementations because they do not cover only IAM in an aspect of zero trust. The most of them are also covering other aspects of zero trust, but we come to that later. But there are also other solutions out there. For example, Keycloak as an open source alternative, uh, we can really recommend. And there are also cloud solutions like Okta or Bear ID, for example. And uh, when you want to implement an IAM solution, I want to give you some considerations with you at home. Because um, it's very essential that your IAM solution supports both protocols, OIDC and SAML. Be you will definitely get to that point that your application uh, is uh, not supporting one of the uh, um, standards. So that's, that's a very key aspect. And uh, also, uh, it's very important that MFA is supported and that you enforce MFA for your whole company. MFA is an absolute key aspect of your infrastructure and of your zero trust infrastructure. We talked about auditing capabilities. I think that's uh, for sure. And uh, something else that's very um, helpful is an identity federation. I mean, most of the providers support it, but um, I just want to mention it because um, Normally, you need partners, you have customers, whatever. They, they manage their own identity management solutions. And if you have a federation in place, you can just federate the identity decision to an upstream identity provider. And what we have learned in a couple of years is that it doesn't make sense to expire passwords um, because people tend to use the same mechanism, mechanisms uh, to, um, uh, in their passwords and they are less secure when you uh, force the people uh, to set a new one each three months, for example. Yeah? Just don't expire it in combination with MFA, you're really good to go. And this is an image I love very well uh, because it shows our daily work. <laughs> you have so many... Um, aspect uh, so, so many layers in your infrastructure in your request chain and how do i get this request chain aware of an identity that's the basic question and the answer is another proxy because um, you need a, a point where you can um, 
yeah, where you can do the decision for an identity um, check, and this is called an identity um, aware proxy. And an identity aware proxy is just an HTTP proxy that is natively supporting the connection to an IDP. And with that, I am able to enforce authentication or maybe already the first authorization principles in your request chain. And this IDP should sit at the very beginning of your request chain so that it's ensured that any request is identified at the very beginning of your chain. And when you select an IDP, um, there are some considerations I want to give you as well. And this thing is uh, sometimes not working. Um, so the first one, of course, it should integrate into your business, right? So I as I said, if you're using one of the big three, you should probably use al also their implementations. Um, but another aspect is that it should support policy-based authorization. And uh, ideally, it also allows you that your application can push policies into your IDP, that your application can decide uh, what authorization mechanisms apply when the identity is going to be verified. Another one is machine-to-machine -machine communi uh, ca communication, because this is also a very important aspect, because you definitely get to that point um, where you need to access resources in your infrastructure from outside. And if you're not able to do that for the machine, you're not able to automate things or you're not able to, to access resources in your infrastructure. And there are solutions out there that do not support it. And there's also a very important th thing that it should support CLI access. If you're not allowed, uh, or if you're not able to access resources from your command line interface in your infrastructure from your local machine, um, then it doesn't make sense for any developer to, to communicate with the cluster or with the infrastructure, right? So uh, these are the key aspects that should be considered when implementing an IIP solution. And then we come to the next important aspect of Zero Trust infrastructure, with I which is about device authentication. We are not going too deep into that, but uh, some points we want to highlight. Um, I mean, de device authentication in general is about um, not only verifying the identity, it's about also verifying the device and the identity in combination. So then I'm able to do contextual access control. I can decide, okay, this identity is only to access my infrastructure with that device, and that device should also sit in a, the German country. And it's not a, if you're uh, outside of Germany, may maybe you are not allowed to access the infrastructure. Or you could even tie it to um, the information from the antivirus or other security parameters from the actual device. Good. The, the next um, group of aspects is around networking and firewalling. Um, and this one is about really f defining boundaries that protect. Um, and there are a couple of aspects. Of course, the more classical network segmentation is still important. So it does not mean if you have zero trust architecture applied that you don't need network segments. That's uh, uh, not the case. Network segments are still um, important and relevant because every traffic that is not allowed don't need to be secret. Um, Software-defined network um, is a thing because then you're able with software to dynamically um, configure your, um, your network. Kubernetes using that concept um, a lot. And uh, networking and network segmentation in the context of zero trust, you always hear or often hear the concept of micro-segmentation. It means putting small boundaries that protect everything that is inside. Um, at the smallest level, put a segmentation boundary around every application um, and uh, yeah, then protect uh, every application as a kind of micro-segment. And there are related topics um, like software-defined parameters or service meshes that help for example, uh, implementing a micro-segmentation. And especially the last aspects are very close to the application logic. That brings me to the next 
aspect, uh, it's uh, the application security, and that is definitely an important aspect, of course, um, in terms of building zero trust-based uh, architectures and solution. The main topic here is uh, really focused around the secure architecture, like um, how are systems uh, that are distributed communicate with each other, how is access control in the application managed, how to deal with tokens, and of course also here there are surrounding and supporting uh, topics like how does an application get to secret and things like this. For that session, we um, yeah, want to explain some of the concept there on an example. So imagine a, a small distributed uh, solution, a small dis distributed um, yeah, architecture where customers want to access certain services in the Zafka portal. The Zafka portal um, needs data from an upstream microservice uh, with contract information. Then there is an invoicing microservice that generates invoices, also needs data. Um, and in a, yeah, see, uh, a secret architecture, um, following that principle, um, of course, a very important um, so-called generic subdomain is the identity and access management solution that is part of, of the overall solution. So every service, every application, also every user that is using the um, system, these identities are managed by an, an uh, IAM solution. In this case, in this example, it could be, for example, Keyclock. So let's go through an example use case. So imagine the customer uh, wants to access a certain resource in the self-care portal. He's not providing any uh, authorization information, so it's not authenticated. So the first thing the self-care portal needs to do is redirect them to the uh, IAM solution using the OpenID Connect protocol in this example. So the customer first needs to provide username and passwords to the IAM solution. The IAM solution takes care of the authentication. Um, and the process in this case, using the authorization code grant. So at the end of that, um, that identification or authorization flow, the Zafka portal has the typical tokens, the ID token, the access token, and the refresh token. Um, and of course, the first thing following the zero trust principle, never trust, always verify, the first thing that microservices need to do is to verify the um, tokens. The tokens are, I mean, they, they are and authenticated, they represent the authenticated informations, they contain authorization informations, and it needs to be validated. Um, validation process contains uh, checking the signature, checking the expiration date, checking the audience, is the microservice really allowed to read the token, um, to mention the, the most important one. And then once the validation is passed, the microservice takes care of the authorization, so deciding if the user is um, yeah, allowed to access this resource. In this example, the application is uh, using the so-called role-based access control, um, checking for the role information of that user. In this case, it's a claim in the token, something that nowadays we see a lot. Um, and in this case, the user is allowed to access the requested resource. On the next slide, I want to explain the concept of a so-called step-up authentication. So imagine that the customer now wants to access a really critical information or resource in the, in the, in the portal, um, maybe changing a contract or something like this. In this case, uh, the business logic says, okay, I want a higher level of assurance that this customer is really the customer he claims to be. Um, currently, the token is, ha does not have that higher level of assurance, so the microservice is triggering a so-called re-authentication process. The customer is again um, redirected to the IAM solution. Um, now with the request, please uh, provide a higher level of assurance. And in this example, the IAM solution is configured to request the customer to um, give a second factor. Yeah, at the end of that re-authentication, the same thing happened like before. Um, the application, the self-care um, portal application now has, again, new ID tokens, access tokens, and refresh tokens. Now with the information that it has the requested level of assurance. So it's really more certain that the customer is the one who, um, who claims to be. Um, the next concept is um, the information that should be shown in the portal needs data from the upstream um, contracting service. So a typical concept in a distributed architecture is to pass tokens around, in this case, uh, provide the token uh, to the upstream service. Um, and the same thing is um, important here as well. So the contracting service in our Example has an API that is protected. Um, it can only be accessed by authenticated um, 
yeah, request. And again, the token is validated, so the contracting service also needs to validate the token. And in our example, the authorization logic here uses so-called attribute-based access control because the contracting uh, service wants to make sure that the requested contract is really allowed to be seen by the customer. So it checks uh, another claim in the token, checking the customer ID and if that is really matching uh, the requested uh, contract. So we just want to show different kind of access control logic. And to finish that example, we want to finish with the service-to-service -service communication. Um, imagine that the invoicing service also needs data from the contracting microservice. Uh, also there, he needs, uh, the, the um, invoicing service needs to uh, request this with an authenticated um, identity. And the OAuth standard has the client credential flow for getting a token for their service. Um, and yeah, then the access token is passed to the contracting service and the contracting service again needs to verify and uh, check the authorization. So that was a small example, but I think it has shown that um, dealing with tokens and identity and knowing the standard is important when designing <coughs> um, distributed uh, solution architecture. If there's one key takeaway maybe from that example, um, it is the takeaway that you should build apps in a way that they theoretically could be exposed to the internet, to the public internet. You should not rely on any parameters that are before. So in theory, it should be possible to put the app to the internet and you're not worried that a minute later it's uh, hacked or breached or whatever. Uh, and the important aspects of it, I think we kind of covered in the, in the example. Yeah, the ne next, ex next aspect is about infrastructure security. So infrastructure security is about managing the security about the devices, the machines, virtual or maybe bare metal machines that are supporting uh, your workloads. And there are a lot of aspects of infrastructure security to be considered, but uh, we can't go into all the details today. There's vulnerability scanning, there's patch management and stuff like that. But two things that we want to point out today is about automation and infrastructure as code, because um, it's still widely present that uh, infrastructure is provisioned manually. And um, this is something that I want to give you home. Please automate everything please automate also your configuration of tools, of infrastructure, of um, everything that is installed in your infrastructure. And another one that I want to point out is about privileged access management. Because I give you an ex example, SSH. Uh, many still use SSH because uh, they want to access their infrastructure, even though it's not required anymore, because if you have an immutable infrastructure, you don't really need SSH anymore. But still, a lot of um, companies use SSH, SSH, and when you have an SSH key to authenticate against your SSH client, um, then you are not uh, able to block an identity and deny the access of that specific SSH key to the infrastructure. You can block that identity in your identity management system, but in the end, this identity is still able to connect to your infrastructure. And there are possibilities to connect SSH to SSO. Uh, and this is, uh, for example, possible with HashiCorp's vault solution in combination with SSH key signing. Um, that's a very simple implementation and you can, uh, you're then able to tie your SSH key to your identity in your single sign-on system. Um, this is uh, very important and uh, something that I really recommend you to dig into because I've still seen that a lot in projects that uh, people are managing SSH keys um, on a different way. <coughs> yeah, next uh, aspect is the aspect of secure data handling. Um, and uh, that topic starts with a more organizational topic because um, in your solution, in your organization, you first need to be very clear uh, in classifying the information. So what is public information, what is restricted, what is confidential, um, and then you can decide how to protect it, how to deal with it. Um, and topics there is like encryption, REST, encryption in transit, even encrypting client side for very critical data. Um, also here, um, you might want to consider hardware-based uh, security modules or hardware-based uh, encryption. Um, yeah, so that is, uh, again, a topic to, to zoom in, but not for now. Um, 
Then we have the aspect of, uh, and we are already at the meta aspects um, of SQL development and delivery that touches, of course, um, a lot of things, also organizational and how teams work together. Um, regarding uh, SQL development and pipeline, we want to focus on the delivery pipeline. So modern um, software development teams, of course, have an automated delivery pipeline, um, and there are a lot of things to consider uh, in terms of security. And when we look at how a classical um, delivery pipeline looks like they it is split in different stages so these are normally the stages that you have in your delivery pipeline and in nearly all of the stages are potential risks that can arise that you need to be aware of and uh, potential vulnerabilities then ca that can can came up and there is one important thing that I still always see a lot and this is about git credentials um, let's go for an example. Um, if you use GitLab, wh who is using GitLab? Okay, a lot. <laughs> cool. Um, because people, uh, uh, companies, um, tie their GitLab solution to their single sign-on system. So you're good to go, right? You have single sign-on for Git. No, you don't have. Because um, you have two options to authenticate with Git when pushing to your GitLab instance. And this is either HTTP-based authentication or by using an SSH key. Both of them do not support the concept of single sign-on. So you block your compromised identity in your IAM solution and the compromised identity is still able to push changes into your Git. And this is really a problem. And uh, there is so an easy solution because there is the Git Credentials Manager out there. Uh, Git Credentials Manager supports SSO from a command line for GitLab, for Bitbucket, for GitHub and for other solutions that can be easily used to have SSO for your Git pushes. And uh, I still see a lot of projects where this has really not been used and I really recommend you to go into that. Um, and there are a lot of uh, a lot of other aspects or a lot of uh, other um, informations that you uh, have in your um, in your pipeline we call it signals yeah in each of the uh, um, of the steps can raise a lot of signals like uh, you have a static security scanning you have a dependency scanning maybe a vulnerability scanning or even a pen test GPT that gives your signals about uh, vulnerabilities that may arise in your pipeline and that guides me to the next topic, which is about security monitoring, because you need to make sense of all the signals. And uh, this is not that easy as it sounds. And um, there are a lot of solutions out there that support it. We have Splunk here. Um, we have New Relic here that uh, have some um, features around it. And um, you, But you should definitely look into that deep and um, be aware of it. Good. And um, the last meta aspect of uh, building zero trust uh, infrastructure or companies um, is the organizational and cultural. Um, it's kind of obvious, but it's uh, really important to mention that this is the basis um, because that's not um, a project and then you are finished. It's really, for some organization, a cultural shift um, towards a security aware and security conscious uh, organization culture because it is so multi-dimensional. You need proper communication, integration, collaboration between different units. Um, also the concept that are well known of DevSecOps and shift left, they are mainly organizational concept. They define how responsibility is shared and how um, teams work together. Um, also not shredding security as a cost just the cost factor, but really as uh, strategically important for the company, belongs to that cultural shift. Um, so that is really crucial uh, because you need to continuously um, really improve on that topic. Um, and information security management tools like ESO or NIST or others, um, they are there to kind of professionalize this, but at the end they target this cultural shift so that it's really part of the, the daily work. So that's what we want to mention this last meta aspect of it. Yeah, and now we had a deeper look in all the aspects of a zero trust, trust infrastructure. When we then go back to Equifax and what happened there, if they have implemented at least a couple of that aspects in a, a good manner, then this would never have been happened, right? 
So it's really important um, to look at this and um, this is what we want to give you um, at home because security is absolutely business critical and we've now seen that zero trust implementation is definitely multi-dimensional and hard to implement but it's totally worth it to invest in such a security. And um, we have summarized our topic today in uh, some facts that we want to uh, point out. Um, so take it with you, never trust, always verify. Keep that in mind for everything you implement and everything you do in your um, zero trust architecture. And strong identity is the absolute base of your zero trust network. And you should definitely know the standards about it. You should know how they work, how they function, what options you have. So uh, look in OIDC, look in SAML, look what, defi what, what they have uh, and um, use that in your infrastructure. And you should always build apps as if they would be public. Just assume they are deployed in the public world and don't rely on any parameters around it. And of course, don't stop. Um, it's a continuous improvement. You always need to improve. You always need to implement changes. Uh, the uh, tools are rapidly um, changing, so you always need to keep up and implement further. And last but not least, we really recommend you to talk to an expert if you have uh, no idea what you're doing or if you have no idea how to start. Um, so that's something we wanted to tell you. Yeah. So um, that's it. That was our talk about Zero Trust. It was really nice to talking to you. And um, if you still have questions for the people that are sitting here in the room, you can come to our desk in the expo and we are happy to discuss uh, some topics with you. I think we also have time for questions now. I think so, yeah. yeah we are pretty good in time, I think. Cool. So are there any questions from, from here? Yes. Yeah. So we lose a lot of trivia, uh, which is uh, I can recommend. Um, but there are also other solutions like Claire, or um, they are also very good. So in the end, it, it doesn't really matter which solution you are using. It makes more sense to make uh, s uh, to deal with it right. And um, I am talking uh, next week on the Cloudland about container vulnerability scanning. Um, well maybe that's interesting for you. Um, yeah. Yeah, for administrators and developers, um, all of these uh, second factor passwords, VPN, so it all makes life kind of harder, I think. So, in what aspects would zero um, trust make life easier for developers and administrators? Do you see, for example, you, you mentioned uh, the GitLab um, identity? Yep. Yeah. So in, in my opinion, um, it makes already the life easier because you don't have to uh, remember 5,000 different passwords. You don't have to maintain uh, 300 SSH keys anymore. You have one single sign-on, you have one identity. And if you combine your MFA, for example, with a Yubi key, it's very convenient. You just click, click on that key to do your multi-factor authentication. Um, so, from from my point of view, zero trust already simplifies the usage. But you're totally right. Um, you have a complexity in the tool chain and in your architecture, and that's definitely a good point. Um, and I don't really have an answer about um, <laughs> having that simplified. Yeah. One thought of this uh, is like. What is this complexity about? Is it necessary because security is important and before you just ignored it? Um, yeah. Or do you have like something in your tool chain and implementation that is making you ex added accidental complexity? And as long as it's really necessary, as it's complexity that is there because security is not an easy topic, that's not really avoidable and you have like tool chains and best practices to, to use that. 
but as with everything, you can also add a lot of accidental complexity in, yeah. in it. Yeah. So no questions from uh, the remote participants? Still any questions here? Yeah? Yeah, so um, some of them we already covered in um, in our presentation slides. Um, it depends a little bit on uh, what the requirements of your company are, because um, if you are good with um, one of the big three and you're uh, also in the, in the public hypervisors, uh, then really go with the solutions they provide, because uh, they're mostly really good in most of the aspects and they normally cover a lot of the aspects uh, from a zero trust architecture. Um, if you are not uh, using one of the big three, um, there are really good open source tools um, in, in, in the outer world. Um, for example, um, uh, Pomerium as an IIP, I can really re recommend. Um, but also Teleport, which covers a more wider perspective of Zero Trust, is a really good uh, recommendation um, for a starting point. Good. Other questions? Yes, one more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good point. Right. Well, we, we forgot something to repeat the question. I yeah. just right. So the question was uh, <laughs> that, uh, like, like, um, what is it? That claim um, or that suggestion that you should build apps as if they would be public? Um, how to do this with legacy applications? Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think if you don't have control over the source code, if you cannot like build it in, um, yeah, identity aware proxies or some proxies that are from the micro segment very close to the application would then be something to um, still use the same concept, but not directly in the app. And we had an interesting discussion also yesterday, like um, at the end, it's, it's the principle that the app should not be um, without verification, so you should have authentication checks and authorization checks. Um, you can do it either in the code by using um, some of the well-proved uh, libraries, but you can also think of um, a proxy that is very close to the application as being part of the application, especially when you deploy it in container environments. It's a sidecar that semantically you can thread at, it belongs to the application. Um, yeah. And for legacy application, that's the way to go, I think. Put yeah. something in front that does it for you. And if you, for example, have a service mesh in place like Istio in a Kubernetes environment, uh, you have also uh, capabilities to secure an application via that. But in the end, technically, it's the same as you would deploy a sidecar container. Um, but that would be the way to go if you have um, a legacy software. And you will always have some legacy software in it. <laughs> it's not compatible. Other questions? Good. Then, thank okay. you again. Thank you very much. <laughs>